I always find it a little bit sad that the, the moniker cyber only stuck uh, with the security community because otherwise we'd have like cyber commerce and cyber dating and cyber networking, all kind of cool words. Uh, but it's only security people that get to use the word cyber. So um, as, as uh, the guy introduced me said, I, um, I worked for a bunch of startups. Uh, I spent most of my time uh, operationally with uh, two startups, both uh, out of Stockholm, Sweden, where I'm originally from. Uh, first one was Spotify, music streaming service that probably most of you knew of. And the other um, that I co-founded is uh, Rap, which, is, uh, which probably most of you haven't heard of. Um, it's an uh, online to offline uh, customer acquisition service for primarily bricks and mortar retailers, uh, but I'll be drawing on experience from both of these um, as I talk about factoring out system components today. So, this was working a moment ago. There we go. Okay, so I've got to stand closer to this thing. Um, how many of you in here are engineers? Can I see some hands? Okay, that's a good amount. And how many of you are what you would maybe call a product person, working with product? Okay, good. And how many of you are founders? Okay, so that's, that's, there's some overlap there. That's good. I think this will be relevant for, um, for most of you. So um, if, you have, if, you're, if you're building a back-end system, you, there's a bunch of components. You might be doing it in some kind of service-oriented or microservices um, architecture, or even if you're building like a big you know, PHP monolith or something, you probably have roughly the same structure, so you're going to have to handle... I'm going to stay over here. You're going to have to handle um, users, you know, you're going to have to have logins, maybe you connect to some login services like Facebook or Twitter or Google accounts. Um, you're going to have to send emails somehow. You might want to send your users notifications to their phones or their web browser. Uh, you're probably going to handle payments, maybe subscriptions for your service. Uh, you'll be logging a bunch of data, and you'll have a lot of analytics that you want to do on that data. Uh, you'll probably have storage of some kind. And then connecting all of this to your apps and your users, you might have some application proxy, maybe a load balancer or something like that. Uh, you might have some static resources that you might put on a CDN, something like that. So most, most backend systems look somewhat like this. Uh, this. These are components that you'll probably be building over and over again in every system. And then there's this little piece of unique business logic that actually makes your startup or your online service uh, special. And this is what your customers will be coming for. This is what your customers will be paying you for. But, um, you know, and if you do this a couple of times, you're building the same thing over and over again, and then you build a little bit of unique stuff. So you're spending most of your engineering resources over here on the left side, um, rebuilding stuff that people have built, tech teams have built many times over, all over the world. And then you spend a little bit of time here, over here, where you're actually adding value and creating something unique. So to think about this, uh, I like to draw an analogy to math, to algebra. If you have an expression like a times b plus a times c, you can simplify that by factoring out the common factor a, and you get a times b plus c. In this case, this whole left part is your a, uh, and then this interesting part are your unique factors b and c but you're spending a lot of time on the A rather than being able to focus on the B and C. So um, this, is, this is why I'm calling it factoring out. So I want to factor out all of these commonalities, all of the A's, um, and not ideally have to do that over and over again when I'm working on a new startup, when I'm building a new backend system. And all of this conceptually applies to your front-end stuff as well, but it's easier to talk about the backend stuff. So uh, here's an example um, of how this has been happening. So these are... This is a photo from 2007, uh, hence you know, the grainy low resolution from a mobile camera of the day, probably one of the first generation iPhones. This was the entire Spotify backend system in 2007, hosted in a data center in East London, in Docklands. So any, anyone using Spotify back then was on the private beta um, and was streaming music from these servers specifically. Uh, and we spent a ton of time finding the right data center. We looked at locations all over Europe and. Uh, we spent a lot of time negotiating um, with vendors for the hardware, and we spent a lot of time installing those and configuring them, installing operating systems, setting up a way to manage these servers, etc. Now, you might not need to do that much for just these few servers, but we were building it for the long run, where we were going to have not a handful, but thousands of servers. Um, and half a decade later, I was involved in 
starting another company, RAP. And this is kind of a picture of the backend system of RAP. We didn't own a single server. Everything was hosted on Amazon, except not really everything was hosted on Amazon. So our code was hosted on Amazon, but then we were interfacing with all of these other SaaS businesses. So we were trying to, in a sense, outsource as much as we could, because um, we were optimizing for time to market. Uh, and we wanted to do as little as possible and focus on just a few things that were unique in what we were doing. And if there was something available that we could use from some other vendor, we would just plug it in. So as a comparison, Spotify was started in uh, August 2006 and launched the service in October 2008. To be fair, a lot of that long delay was driven by the time it took to get the licenses. Um, but RAP had a lot of external dependencies as well. We needed to get tons of retailers on board for the platform to be interesting to our users. Uh, and that company was started in May 2011 and launched in September the same year. So everything was built just over the summer. Uh, and that's what you can do now with um, you know, access to all of these services. And this is a trend. Uh, it didn't start in 2011. Obviously, this is a trend that's been going on for almost as long as there has been computers. So looking back at um, the first tech boom, the last decade of the, last, the previous millennium, um, you would be, if you were setting up something, you know, a web-based company back then, you would be buying a lot of expensive servers, probably from a company like Sun. Uh, you would be buying a lot of expensive proprietary software, probably also from Sun, maybe from Oracle, who incidentally ended up acquiring Sun. Um, and you would be building most of the rest yourself from scratch, writing every line of code to support whatever it is your website was going to do. Uh, and slowly but steadily during that decade, we started to see the introduction of open source. Again, open source is something that's existed a lot longer, probably as long as there have been computers. Initially, all software, all source code was open. People were just academics sharing whatever they created with each other. And in the 80s, you had this um, guru at MIT, Richard Stallman, uh, who started the free software movement. Uh, he hated the term open source, by the way. He, he wanted you to focus on the ideology of freedom and call it free software, rather than you know, the technicality of the source code being open. He didn't really win that battle of words, so everyone refers to it as open source. But increasingly during this decade, um, well, I want to mention, though, that his, his big contribution to, to the tech world was uh, the GNU stack of um, what became the Linux operating system. So in 91, 92, Linux Torvalds created a kernel. Um, but the rest of the operating system already existed. Um, and that's what pretty much um, every server runs today, including most of your phones, if you're on Android. This was the new norm. Um, and we were running uh, open source stacks on top of these things like the LAMP stack was the standard at this time. Now it feels outdated, but this is what people were, were building their startups on back then. Uh, so you had outsourced a lot of the things that you used to build yourself to just a standard open source stack that you would plug in and that your new hires would know how to use because it worked on it for other startups, and it was all the same. So you had factored out all of those components to just a standard stack that everyone knew of, and you were saving a lot of time. So companies were being built and launched a lot faster in this decade than the decade before, um, using a lot less venture capital, because it had dried up after the first crash. And then, of course, it became much more available towards the end of that decade. Um, but in the beginning, um, control of costs was very important, which helped drive this trend. Now, what did start happening during this decade was uh, the introduction of cloud computing. So things like Amazon Web Services were launched. Uh, increasingly, uh, or in initially, people were found that like new and scary and didn't want to be so dependent on a third-party vendor. But increasingly, over time, it became the new norm. Everyone hosted everything on Amazon. Even now, at this point, Spotify is transitioning a lot of their backend system to the Google Compute Cloud. Um, they, they still maintain thousands of servers themselves, but over time, it'll all be transitioned to someone else's platform. Now, um, this decade that we're in right now, what we're seeing is the new norm is cloud computing. No one, no startups really, unless they're doing something very specific, no startup will bother owning their own servers anymore. Uh, but they're still kind of maintaining sort of their own, the, the entire backend system, mostly as like one sort of single entity. Um, they have everything on Amazon, perhaps. They have everything on Google or, or Microsoft Azure, it doesn't matter. Um, but there's still sort of one cohesive thing, um, but increasingly people are, are moving away from that and getting more, um, let's say, more, more uh, confident that they can actually have dependencies external to their system that they control. And back-end systems, well, we can skip this, back-end systems are starting to look more like this. Uh, we can go back to that slide quickly because it does have an interesting point. 
Probably most of you are familiar with it at this time, but it's still, it's still interesting to see it with concrete numbers. So this is the number of servers uh, during the first half decade or so of Spotify's existence and during the first couple of years of RAP. Uh, and as you can see, uh, with Spotify, we were always either under-provisioned or over-provisioned. So either we were running out of servers and it was really difficult to launch new features because you didn't have any servers to put the new code on, uh, or we had a ton more servers than we needed at that moment because you would buy and go to price with your vendor and you spend a lot of time doing this. Whereas when something is on a cloud computing platform, you just add more machines with a click of the mouse or even auto-scaling as you get more users. Now, um, so during, during like the decade we're in right now, increasingly back-end systems look you know, less like a rack of servers and more like just a bunch of distributed applications that you connect. And, and I think this trend is going to continue, but it's also going to get um, even deeper into your application. So, um, we are seeing you know, the, the platforms, things like Amazon, Google Compute Cloud, they're getting more sophisticated, uh, and they're rising through the abstract, abstraction layers. I think not a month passes without Amazon launching some new service that will help you build your backend system a little bit more efficiently. They do more and more sophisticated things for you. It's you know, very far from just being a virtual private server at this point. Um, it's a whole, like, it's a vast ecosystem of, of services you can plug in uh, to make your life easier. Um, same thing with Google, same thing with Azure. Of course, you're tying yourself um, pretty tightly to one vendor by doing this, which is something people consider scary. Uh, from my point of view, uh, if I was starting a company now, I would not be afraid of this. I would, you know, I would value time to market much more than you know, some future risk of being dependent on one vendor. Uh, one reason for that is uh, that as you're just starting out, you don't even know if there is a market for your startup. So your primary concern is to find that out as fast as you possibly can. Uh, and if you have a problem of you know, your vendor charging you a little bit much when you have hundreds of millions of users sometime down the road, that's a good problem to have as a startup. That's the problems you want to have. Whereas the problems for most startups is to build something that no one actually wanted in the end. So that you want to find out as quickly as possible whether there's a product market fit in startup lingo. Uh, and you want to get to market as quickly as possible, so don't worry about dependencies. Um, you should celebrate dependencies because it means someone else wrote the code for you. So we're also seeing, of course, more and more SaaS components, um, as I showed you in the previous slide with the wrap backend. It's just getting you know, a lot of other external components that you string together to something to support your app. But I think the mo two most interesting things are starting to happen kind of now. Uh, one is unified app platforms. Um, Google acquired a company called Firebase a few years back uh, and did a big relaunch of it uh, just like two days ago, I think, at Google I.O., uh, adding a lot of new features. Uh, and that's a stack which solves almost every one of those blue boxes on the diagrams that I, that I showed you. So all of that is provided for you in a single platform, um, and they can scale it for you. They, you know, everything works together. There's only one company to pay for it. And of course, you're even more tightly um, dependent on one vendor. Again, I think this is less of a problem than getting to market faster. The last point I want to talk about, and where we haven't seen a lot yet, but where I think we will see more and more, is like entire vertically integrated um, startup backend platforms. Now, there's a lot of buzzwords, so I'll try to explain what I'm, what I'm saying by pointing to two examples that actually already exist and have existed for a long time, but they're a little bit unique to their industries. One is um, for e-commerce. So if you're starting an e-commerce um, startup right now, few people would build their own backend system. Most people would just use one of the many good existing ones. Uh, either they're hosted on you know, their own Amazon accounts, potentially their own servers, but that's unlikely, or they buy something which is hosted in the cloud entirely, Regardless of which, they're writing very few lines of code. They're customizing a platform specifically for their vertical, um, maybe even specifically for their market, um, and just adding whatever is unique, sometimes even logistics. The shipping of the goods is included in that platform. The other such vertical uh, is publishing. So if you're setting up some kind of media site, you're also unlikely to build your own backend system. You might if you think you can add some unique value doing so, and some do, but most end up using you know, something, either something open source like WordPress, which can even be hosted at wordpress.com, or that you could even publish on Medium or Facebook these days, or you can buy a commercial content management system and put your media site on that. Um, so those are two examples that have existed for quite a long time. Probably the first one started appearing almost two decades ago. But we're not yet seeing much of this in other verticals, and I think this is going to change. So I'm spending a lot of time these days in, in different parts of the world, uh, trying to work locally with startups and investors, most recently in Jakarta, 
in Indonesia and in Singapore. Um, and what we're seeing there, as well as you know, all over Europe and pretty much every part of the world, is that people are starting the same startups over and over again. There's a lot of cloning going on, um, particularly these days when you have so many startups that have a very heavy offline component, any kind of two-sided marketplace startup or anything like that, where you need a lot of local know-how, you need connections to a lot of local vendors, uh, you need local marketing skills, all of those things. Um, so one example of that could be um, maybe in Instacart or maybe even more interestingly a Postmates, like a delivery company, uh, which brings you things for restaurants or grocery stores, etc. cetera, um, needs a lot of local know-how. It's not easy to build that company out of San Francisco, say, where, uh, where um, Postmates was started and, and cover the market globally. It's very, very difficult. So that's why you're seeing local teams tackling that problem, essentially building the same product, but connected to the local market. Uh, so you have hundreds of those. You have a handful probably in every large region in the world. And they're all building essentially the same technology system. So you have all of these tech teams all over the world, and everyone's competing for that talent, and they're building the same thing over and over again. So someone should just step in and build like, the Postmates platform or the, you know, the grocery delivery platform and make that available for anyone with that local know-how to just step in and add that without writing pretty much any lines of code. Another such example would be uh, maybe something like ClassPass. That's another thing. We're seeing a handful of it in, in every market that we go to. It's um, sort of a distributed gym membership. So you pay a monthly fee to ClassPass, and then you can go work out at any gym in the city. Again, needs a lot of local connections. It's very hard to launch that globally out of San Francisco. So you're seeing them in every location, and they're all building the same technology over and over again. And most of these founders tend to be not very technical founders. So it's very challenging for them to find engineers to build it for them, but they still have to. Um, so vertical stacks like this are things that I think we will see a lot more of in the future. Um, now, as an engineer, you might think, hey, I'm being replaced. I, I think that's entirely the wrong way to look at it. I think you should celebrate this because it means you will get to write more interesting code that's actually adding value to the business you work for as opposed to just replicating things that hundreds of other engineers are doing all over the world at the same time or have done before. Um, so that's where I think we're going when it comes to how backend systems are going to look in the near to you know, mid-future. Thank you. Any questions on that? You're the, you're the first and only speaker I know who finishes ahead of time, so congratulations for that. Thank so you. I'll, I'll be, um, definitely going to, um, to ask a question. So you addressed a lot like how the, like the factoring out helps like the startup itself, but would you also see, like, a, a, like since there's a lot of entrepreneurs in the audience, would you also see like a, a case for somebody like to, to like make a business out of this kind of things, and where's like where you see the most exciting opportunities, because again, a lot of it is very deep technology, so where do you see like, the most exciting opportunities for companies being created in that space? Well, absolutely. So I, I skipped a few slides in the end because I kind of went ahead of myself and talked about them without moving forward in the slides. But I think the last line here, which is a quote from 2007, is kind of interesting. So one way to find, out, find a new startup idea is look at you know, the list of Unix commands and figure out something that hasn't been implemented online already. Now this is, you've probably heard this before, but it's, it's an interesting way of looking at things that you can provide as a service. Um, because, you know, just like you on a Unix command line can do sophisticated things by stringing commands along each other with, like, the pipe operator, you can do the same thing online with uh, SaaS businesses. So there's still a lot of opportunity there. And then, of course, in, you know, the space of these sort of vertically integrated backend stacks, I think there's a lot of, like, opportunity there for a very tech-heavy startup that doesn't really want to go and do all of this, you know, local kind of making deals with local vendors and marketing and all that, rather just focus on building tech stacks. So yeah, maybe we're, what we're seeing is um, that the whole sort of starting a company is being chunked up into more technical pieces and more business or marketing oriented pieces. And we'll just plug all of these together in like a set of different companies. That was a very geeky answer. The first time that I hear to look for Unix command for business ideas, but it seems like I never learn enough. So thank you very much, Andreas, for coming. Thank you.